on this Tuesday night, a revolt within the Conservative Party. Federal leader Aaron O'Toole vows to put up a fight as he faces a vote on his future. There's only so long that the party can tolerate this kind of dissent internally. Can he survive? And what does the rift mean for the party? The RCMP moves in to clear a border blockade in Alberta. But at the end of the day, that border's got to get open. The mounting frustration over the trucker-led protests clogging the nation's capital. Plus, as the Omicron wave shows signs of cresting in the east, hospitals in Western Canada are still feeling the crush. And the final act for a football superstar. After seven Super Bowl titles, Tom Brady leaves the field his legacy and next chapter. Global National with Donna Friesen. Good evening and thanks for joining us. The internal rift within the Federal Conservative Party is spilling out into the open. Leader Aaron O'Toole is facing a caucus revolt. At the same time as some of the protesters in Ottawa, now into their fourth day of disrupting the downtown core, are focusing their sights on Prime Minister Justin Trudeau, it is actually Aaron O'Toole's future that is now on the line. And it is happening fast. MPs will vote tomorrow by secret ballot during the Conservative caucus meeting. O'Toole says the party is at a crossroads and must choose either an angry, negative, extreme path or a more moderate one. Our Ottawa Bureau Chief Mercedes Stevenson has our top story tonight. You support Mr. O'Toole, sir. The revolt against Aaron O'Toole is widespread and very public. I think the leader's position is untenable right now. The fact is that uh, the process has been initiated, and when 35 members of caucus call on the leader to effectively resign, then I think that perhaps that's the leader has some thinking to do. Nearly one-third of the Conservative caucus have signed a letter rising up against their leader. O'Toole says he will stand and fight to stay in power, tweeting, I'm not going anywhere and I'm not turning back. Canada needs us to be united and serious. It's time for a reckoning to settle this in caucus, right here, right now, once and for all, anger versus optimism. Even if O'Toole wins, staying on after losing confidence of so much of caucus would be difficult. I think he will go down at the end of the day because there's only so long that the party can tolerate this kind of dissent internally. He's been trying to stamp it out since the election and it hasn't worked. The September election loss is a key irritant where O'Toole swung to the centre and flip-flopped on major policies. Those who want O'Toole out say he is unprincipled and doesn't listen to caucus. They're angry about his policies on climate change and gun control, but deny ideological differences are their bottom line. O'Toole's supporters characterize the battle as a war for the soul of the Conservative Party, modern and electable or outdated and fringe. But that doesn't explain O'Toole's low polling numbers and difficulty fundraising. That's, I think, vital. Michelle Rempel Garner backs O'Toole and says another leadership campaign is a distraction. A month long, months long leadership process right now. Um, I mean, that's time not spent holding Justin Trudeau to account. Conservative strategist Tasha Kiridan says internal divides over the trucker protest in Ottawa turned simmering dissent into an explosive leadership challenge. I think that uh, what happened on the weekend um, has shown that there is a serious schism within the party that probably can't be healed. Tonight, sources tell Global News, Aaron O'Toole is calling members a caucus, opening the door to changing his policies again if he can stay on as leader. They say that's too little too late and that it won't address the main issue for them, trust. Donna? All right, Mercedes Stevenson in Ottawa, thanks. And this is southern Alberta. The RCMP are trying to clear a blockade at a busy border crossing into the U.S. Police announced earlier today that they decided that blockade by protesters angry about vaccine mandates and public health restrictions is no longer lawful, and they moved in. The protest by truckers, farmers, and others has stopped the flow of goods and people across the border for four days and trapped some truckers who don't support it. Our Heather Urex west has been at the scene all day. Heather, Alberta's premier just spoke to the media. He again called the protests unacceptable. What else did he say? 
Well, Donna, he began by expressing some support for those who were participating in lawful protests against vaccine mandates for, for truckers. He said that he, in his recent uh, trip to Washington, that he was looking for allies to find an exemption for unvaccinated uh, cross-border truckers who uh, didn't, uh, so they shouldn't um, have to quarantine. But he went on to call this blockade illegal and unacceptable. He urged protesters um, to, to quit. And he also called for calm um, after uh, several uh, disturbing reports of violence um, involving protesters within the last couple of hours. I have also received reports uh, in the last hour of people uh, allied with the protesters assaulting RCMP officers, including in one instance trying to ram members of the RCMP, uh, later leading to a collision with a civilian uh, vehicle. This kind of conduct is totally unacceptable. Heather, the blockade is still in place, though. The RCMP still there. Any sign of a resolution soon? Uh, no. In fact, we have about 100 uh, vehicles still blockading the road. And uh, from what we can see, it, it seems as though RCMP have uh, pulled pulled back. We're not seeing the helicopter circling. Um, we're, we're not seeing a, a, the same kind of presence that we were seeing a couple of hours ago. But we have seen new uh, police enforcements arrive. Uh, just a short time ago, we saw uh, five police cars from the Lethbridge Police Service arrive, uh, more vehicles from Canadian Border Services Agency. So while we don't have an official update on the RCMP's plans th this evening, um, this is still a, a very fluid situation and one that we will, of course, be continuing to watch in the hours and, and days ahead. All right, Heather Yorick's West in Coots, Alberta. Thanks. Meanwhile, in Ottawa, businesses and people who live downtown are still dealing with the honking and the trucks and the disruption of that ongoing protest over vaccine mandates and public health restrictions. Abigail Beeman has been speaking with people around Parliament Hill today, where it appears there is also no resolution in sight. Next. A breakfast barbecue in the middle of what's normally a busy downtown street, now full of parked vehicles. These truckers say they've been so overrun with donations, they're feeding people in the neighborhood, too. We came here uh, to be uh, respectful of the people that live in the city, but still make our cause heard. But some fed up residents feel all this has become more occupation than protest. Alan Gemmel took a sandwich, calling it repayment for his lack of sleep. And all we hear is these horns going all night long. It's driving us crazy. I haven't slept in three days. We're trying to get to campus, but all of the um, bus routes to campus are closed. It's a little bit intimidating coming into work, which I have to do every day. They're in the, what I would call the splash zone. I feel bad for them, um, and, but when you want to change something in history, there's always going to be some un uncomfortableness involved in that. There are fewer vehicles, but it's still complete gridlock on a number of downtown Ottawa streets like this one. And a number of businesses and amenities remain closed, including a major downtown mall, two child care centers, a vaccination clinic, and a number of businesses. It's, it's like we're being held hostage down here. The Metropolitan Brasserie shut its doors after it became clear delivery drivers couldn't get through. We've heard the message and now you're hurting our businesses and we really would just ask that they leave peacefully and let our city get back to business because you're really just ruining people. The, the noise pollution itself, the constant honking, you know, it seems as like a, like a real scare tactic. The protest prompted Ellie Charters to start a grassroots walking buddy program for downtown residents operating through Twitter DMs. It doesn't seem to me as though any concrete actions to make people feel safe is happening on the part of the police or the mayor. Many want police to start ticketing and towing, but that's not happening yet and an end game isn't clear. We're not going anywhere. We've lost our jobs, a lot of us. Some of us have lost our houses. Some of us will lose our houses. With some residents calling for more action, there were no updates from police today. One is scheduled for Wednesday. There is now a tip line to report hate incidents or anything criminal related to these protests, but police haven't said how many calls they've yet received. Donna? Abigail Beeman in a still noisy downtown Ottawa, thanks. 
To the pandemic now and a major reversal from Quebec Premier Francois Legault. He is scrapping plans to impose a tax on the unvaccinated because he says he's seeing growing discontent about it. I understand that this divides Quebecers and right now we need to build bridges to listen to each other. The proposed tax was initially billed as a way to help reduce the burden of unvaccinated patients on Quebec's hospitals. Legault repeated today that the unvaccinated are much more likely to end up in the hospital with COVID-19. He says the province plans to use other ways to encourage people to get the shot. New modeling out of Ontario suggests the Omicron wave has plateaued in that province. As in other provinces, though, hospitalizations, which are a lagging indicator, remain a concern. Jamie Marocker looks at what could happen as public health restrictions begin to ease. Dr. Laura Harlock is coming off a 10-day stretch inside the ICU at this Toronto hospital, where one-third of its 37 beds with ventilators are occupied by COVID patients. We're still getting COVID uh, admissions or people with COVID who need our help. Um, it's slowing in terms of the rate a little bit. The latest hospitalization numbers from Ontario and Quebec are trending downward. But as the provinces reopen, there's concern the dip may not last. We could face potentially in March um, a peak which is even higher. That's what we need to avoid. That's not what anyone wants to hear. With frustrations growing over COVID restrictions and lockdowns, as we watch other countries like the UK and Denmark open up, you can look at what other countries are doing, but please don't just follow blindly what every other country is doing. Although the majority, almost 78% of Canadians, are fully vaccinated, booster uptake is still less than half, and our healthcare systems continue to struggle. Hospitals and care clinics are extremely short staffed, and workers are exhausted from yet another wave. And in the West, hospitalizations are still rising. Manitoba and BC with record numbers this week. We can't look at it linearly. Um, we have to look at it all together, what's happening. We have multiple indicators that the peak virus load was um, earlier in January. Um, we know that hospitalizations follow that. Health officials also warn Omicron won't likely be the end of COVID. Harluck knows it's almost a certainty more variants will emerge and worries we continue to be reactive versus proactive. Repeating the same mistakes over and over again is not going to get us anywhere. I'm wondering how critical care units will fare if they have to weather yet another wave. Jamie Marocker, Global News, Toronto. Now to some breaking news out of the U.S. Pfizer and BioNTech are seeking emergency use authorization of the COVID-19 vaccine for children under age five. The companies say they have submitted data for a two-dose vaccine for children six months to four years old. That's despite disappointing clinical trial results that showed a lower immune response in some younger age groups. The companies say they are researching whether three doses will work. Health Canada says it has not yet received an application from Pfizer for children under age five, though it's expected in the coming weeks. Allegations from Russia over the crisis in Ukraine. Coming up, Vladimir Putin accuses the U.S. of trying to draw his country into war. There is a new warning from the Canadian government about travel to Ukraine. It says security conditions are unpredictable and could deteriorate without notice. Canadians are asked to avoid all travel to Ukraine. Anyone already there is being urged to leave while commercial means are available. Hopes for a diplomatic solution are fading. In his first significant comments in weeks, Russian President Vladimir Putin said today he's not backing down. And he's accusing the U.S. of trying to lure Russia into war. Jackson Prosko reports. The Russian buildup now extends to Belarus, where thousands of troops are planning snap exercises on Ukraine's northern border. In Moscow, President Vladimir Putin accused the U.S. of trying to draw Russia into armed conflict, warning American attempts at diplomacy, outlined in a letter last week, were badly off course. Fundamental Russian concerns were ignored, he said. Putin's demands include rolling back the size of NATO and banning Ukraine from joining the alliance. 
The West isn't budging on either point. In Kyiv, where the British Prime Minister paid a visit, there are signs the Ukrainian government now views the Russian threat with the same alarm as the West. This wouldn't be a war between Ukraine and Russia, warned Ukrainian President Zelensky. This would be a full-scale war in Europe. A further Russian invasion of Ukraine would be a political disaster, a humanitarian disaster. Ukraine, the UK and Poland are now preparing to form their own trilateral alliance. At NATO headquarters, Canada's defense minister echoed the Western view that what happens next is up to Putin. Russia has an important choice to make. It can choose to negotiate with a view to de-escalation or it can face harsh economic sanctions. Despite all those worrying signs, Putin did leave the door open to more dialogue, suggesting a deal may be reached eventually. The U.S. is still waiting on a formal Russian response to its written proposals. So far, there's no sign there will be enough there to end the tense stare-down over Ukraine. Jackson Prosco, Global News, Washington. Stuck in another crisis ahead, the Afghan family bound for Canada, stranded in Ukraine. As tensions grow in Ukraine, one family from Afghanistan is facing an especially uncertain future there. In the fall, we introduced you to Javid Hakmal, a former Canadian forces interpreter. After the Taliban takeover, his family fled to Ukraine in hopes of coming to Canada, but their asylum claim still hasn't been approved. And now, with embassy staff leaving Ukraine, they're in limbo once again. Crystal Gamansing reports. Javid Ahmad Hakmal came to Ukraine six months ago, fleeing the Taliban with his family. He never dreamed he'd still be here now. I'm really shocked. The worst thing is, you know, I have a pregnant woman. I'm just surprised, I'm just shocked about this issue, that what will I do with this woman if the war is started? Stuck in a foreign country with an expectant wife, no language skills, no money and no support. Hakmal and his 11 family members landed in Kyiv as a transit stop. They hoped on their way to Canada. The former Canadian Forces interpreter was rescued from Kabul after the Taliban took over. His connection to Canada put his life at risk and his families. We met the Hakmals in October when their temporary visas expired. They'd spent nearly every hour of every day in their hotel, which is paid for by the Globe and Mail. It helped him and another Afghan interpreter who worked for the paper to safety. The kids are bigger now, and they're happy to see new faces and play. Their dad, however, says he isn't giving them the life they deserve. This was not his plan for them. If by chance the prime minister or the immigration minister or the defense minister sees this, what do you want to say to them? I will tell them, I'm a human like you too. You put me in shit there, you don't care about me. And the time you needed me, you used me. Anger born out of pain and fear. His calls go unreturned, his questions unanswered. Like thousands of others, he says he's told only his application is being processed. We reached out to multiple government departments for comment. IRCC sent a statement saying it is doing the utmost to process cases. There is nothing else for me. Nothing, no hope is left for me. His family back in Afghanistan asks about the war in Ukraine. He lies and says there are no worries, no risks. But privately, he fears what could happen next. Crystal Gamansing, Global News, Kyiv. The end of an era next. Tom Brady is finally leaving the field. Well, there are football stars, and then there's Tom Brady. Over 22 years of quarterbacking, he has racked up a record seven Super Bowl wins. And even if you're not a football fan, you've no doubt heard about him. Today, at age 44, Brady announced he is retiring. Eric Sorensen looks at his almost mythical and complicated stature as a sports star. He was an unheralded sixth-round draft pick, and yet Tom Brady all but put to rest any debate over who's the greatest quarterback of all time. He's the best of all time. No one touches him. 
Hall of Fame, best of all time, nothing else would be said. He was cool under pressure, orchestrated sensational comebacks, and was even lucky at times, though was never comfortable talking about his legacy. I'm not good with, you know, things like that. So mm -hmm. I, I, um, I mean, I feel like I've done a great job to maximize what my potential was. Brady set touchdown and passing records, won an unprecedented seven Super Bowls, and was the MVP in five of them. I think some spaceship dropped Tom Brady off on this planet a lot of years ago. He's a freak. It's as simple as that and uh, always a joy to watch. In a brutal sport that shortens most careers to an average of three and a half years, Brady excelled for 22 seasons. He should be one of the most beloved athletes, but it's more complicated than that. I would never do anything to break the rules. Um. His New England Patriots were once caught spying on another team. Brady was once suspended after footballs were deflated for him by a team manager. Some didn't like his politics, a fan of Donald Trump. And when teammates took a knee to protest racial injustice, Brady did not. For many, a polarizing figure. Whether you love him or whether you hate him, you know, you have to respect them because the stats and the accolades just speak for themselves. I hate Tom Brady so much, but I... Brady learned to laugh at being hated. But I hope they break his leg. <laughs> but critics could not deny his enduring talent. In a statement, he called his career a thrilling ride and far beyond my imagination, adding that now it's best I leave the field to the next generation. Tom Brady will be a tough act to follow. Eric Sorensen, Global News. And that is Global National for this Tuesday. I'm Donna Friesen. Tonight's Your Canada is Grand Pre, Nova Scotia. There are beautiful spots all over this country. Please email us yours to viewers at globalnational.com. Thanks for watching. Hope to see you here again tomorrow. Take care of yourselves. Bye-bye.